Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to session 52 of the Behavioral Observations Podcast. I've got a great conversation today to share with you with Dr. Matt Broadhead from Michigan State University. He is the author of the upcoming or forthcoming, if you will, Practical Ethics for Effective Treatment of Autism Spectrum Disorders. And if it's not available now, it'll be available in the very near future. Uh, We talk about a range of issues in ethics. Uh, We talk about scope of competence versus scope of practice. We discuss how to play well with others. In other words, working on multidisciplinary teams. And we even tackle the age-old, should you accept a glass of water question? Yes, that's probably you know, uh, ubiquitous to every ethics discussion. And uh, we, we get into that a little bit and hopefully give you a different angle about what that means and uh, and things like that. So um, we also talk about a bunch of papers, or I should say he references a bunch of articles along the way. And I have done my best to source those articles. And you can find those in the show notes at behavioralobservations.com. So Again, uh, I'm really excited to share this interview with you. So without any further ado, let's hear from Matt Broadhead. Welcome to the Behavioral Observations Podcast, stimulating talk for today's behavior analysts. Now here's your host, Matt Sicoria. Dr. Matthew Broadhead, thank you for joining me today on the Behavioral Observations Podcast. How are you doing today? I'm doing well, Matt. Uh, thanks for having me, and I'm really looking forward to talking with you today. Yeah, same here. You know, this is uh, something that's been uh, we've been planning for uh, you know what a couple of weeks or so, and um, you know I appreciate. I think we were chatting via Twitter for a little bit, and so I appreciate taking time out of your. Monday morning to come chat about ethics, and uh, apparently you've got a uh, a new book coming out. And you want to let us know what the what it's called, and uh, we can get into the details of that in a second. But yeah, what's, the, uh, what's the title? Yeah, absolutely. The the book's t- uh, called Practical Ethics for the Effective Treatment of Autism Spectrum Disorder, or at least that's the uh, tentative title anyway. And and it's co-authored by um, uh, with David Cox and Sean Quigley, and we expect it to be out sometime midsummer, and we're very excited about it. So, looking forward to talking about ethics and also that book, and and sharing um, uh, sharing some of the details because uh, I'm really really excited about it, really proud of it. Awesome. We'll get into that in a second. But uh, first, I want to know uh, how did you go from uh, being the child of some ski bums to yeah. a professor at Michigan State? So, if you can kind of, I mean, I mean, I mean, don't take us back to the womb, of course, but uh, you know, let us know uh, how you got into behavior analysis and how'd you wind up doing what you're doing now? Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, Matt mentioned that I, that I was, um, uh, you know, a kid of some ski bombs. I was born in Salt Lake City and my parents lived in Park City. We moved to uh, a town called Harbor Springs when I was young. It's in northern Michigan. Very beautiful place, but I grew up next to a ski hill. And so skiing really kind of has been in my life. A very important piece, but you know, in high school and um, you know even middle school, even there wasn't really a whole lot to do in Harbor Springs uh, as a kid. And one of the things that I did find a lot of or put a lot of energy or effort towards was playing music. And so I had initially thought that I was going to be a musician. And you know, when I was in high school, I was playing on this band called um, something different in the homemade jam as a funk band. We were doing festivals and and touring around and really having a good time. And so I go into college and I'm just kind of feeling like, you know, I went to college because I kind of felt like I had to, but really my passion was uh, to play music. What instrument did you play? I played drums. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, it was really, really awesome. I mean, really awesome experience. I really love, you know, pretty much anything percussion in general. And, um, and really, so, you know, I'm playing music and, and in college, I'm in this punk band and, you know, and I'm just kind of floating along in my coursework and I'm switching majors. I've gone through about three or four and I finally settle on psychology because I just kind of figured maybe that sounded like a good back backup thing if the um, music didn't work out, <laughs> you know, which, you know, it's okay. my safety major. My safety, right? Yeah, psychology is everyone's everyone's uh, everyone's back. Do that or communications is the one I, that was big right. in, when I was in school. 
Yeah, and I promise. I actually, I was a communications major for a while too. It's funny that you say that. So, yeah. So I've taken Psych 250 at Western Michigan, and that's our the abnormal psych class. And I am talking with the TA, and the TA says, "All right, who are you going to take for Psych 360?" And that's Psych 360 is the principles of behavior class uh, for undergraduate students at Western. At the same time, I had missed a deadline for applying for practicum. Uh, or practica at Western. There, for all the practica, you had to put in an application to be able to work in them as an undergraduate, but there was one that you didn't have to, and that was the practicum at Croydon Avenue Schools. And just Croydon Avenue School practicum uh, in the um, the course sequence, and I didn't know what that was. So, so I, I signed up for that because I knew I needed to do that. So you know, summer goes by and, and then, you know, go into fall and I stroll into Psych 360 and it's this giant lecture hall and there's about 100 students in it. With that class, I had no idea, but there's a rat lab associated with it, too. So undergraduate rat lab where we go twice a week to uh, um, a rat lab and we go through a series of experiments and actually the hand um, operated dipper. So it wasn't um, electronic by any sense. So if you want to shape the rat's lever press or condition water as a reinforce or the, uh, the dipper click as a reinforcer, you have to do it all by hand. I'm in his rat lab applying the principles of behavior at a basic level or the um, animal um, uh, learning level. And then I am, um, working with children with autism and uh, and applying those procedures and principles in a socially significant way. And I am absolutely hooked. Like my world is coming together. It's making sense to me. And it occurs to me that this is where I belong and I am here to stay. Cool. So that, yeah, that's the, I mean, that that's kind the- now, how the far into the semester did it take to for that uh, light to dawn? Just you know, roughly, or was it you know within the first week or so? Or I think it was about halfway through, Matt. I because I started to realize that was the first college class that I had actually devoted and paid meaningful attention to. I was reading the textbook, which was something that I had never done before. I was you know, staying on top of the homework, which is something that I had never done before. And I was giving it a very honest and concerted effort. And that, that clicked to me. That was the same type of effort that I had given only to music, I think, prior. And so that's how it resonated with me that this was something special. I was feeling a connection to this that I hadn't, um, I'd only felt with a couple other things in my life. And so that's, that was you know, maybe mid-semester where, where it hit for me. Are you looking for a new job, but you're overwhelmed with all the emails that you're getting from various ABA agencies? What if there was someone who was in your corner and could help you find the perfect job placement? Well, that person exists. Barbara Voss has been working as a recruiter for over 30 years, and her company, HRIC, specializes in placing BCBAs in permanent full-time positions throughout the United States. Barbara has been placing BCBAs since 2011, so she knows our business, and she offers personalized service to any BCBA looking for a new position. She also helps companies looking to hire BCBAs, too. Here are just some of the things Barbara can help you with. She can provide information about salary ranges in different markets across the country. She can help you write your resume. She can coordinate and prepare you for the interview process and even help negotiate the right salary for you. And best of all, there are no charges to any candidate for all of these services. When you are ready to make a change and want to work with someone who will listen to you and understand what you need in a new position, contact Barbara at HRIC. To schedule a confidential discussion, head over to hricolorado.com. Again, that's hricolorado.com and hit the contact button to connect with Barbara. You won't be disappointed. Now you're at Michigan State, and so tell us a little bit about what you're doing there. Yeah, so I am an assistant professor here at Michigan State, and I I'm in the College of Education and in the special ed program, which is housed in the 
Department of Counseling, Ed Psych, and, and Special Ed. So my role here is to conduct research mainly in the area of autism treatment and to mentor graduate students and try to get grant money, which is you know, <laughs> kind of one of the big things, you know, uh, one of our big values here, which, which is a lot of fun. So we have uh, what's called the Early Learning Institute, which is directed by Dr. Josh Plavnik, and it is early intervention program for children with autism, and it's community-based programs. It's located in three schools, and they um, have a big emphasis on social skills instruction, and actually a lot of the kids have place, places carved out in early childhood classrooms typically developing children. So we're able to take our students and integrate them into those social situations where they can learn from and integrate with their peers and think at a meaningful level. So we have, I think, a really great um, program here and really it provides me with an opportunity for some answering some really awesome research questions. So what is it? Do you have a main focus of your research right now? Yeah, social skills. It, and so I do a lot with, um, you know, peer-to-peer -peer interactions. A recent study, uh, a couple studies that I've done is to, you know, children with autism communicating with one another using visual supports and the, the removal of those. Um, I'm interested in multiple exemplar training, enhancing the um, the quality of those interactions, improving variability of, of social statements. And we're also interested, in my graduate students are in choice and preference. And so we've done a lot of work in preference assessments as well. And one of the things that we are currently focused on are video-based preference assessments to try to figure out how we can accurately assess preference for items or activities that aren't necessarily present in, immediately, but may be available in the near or distant future. Um, such as gifts, uh, trips, activities, um, so we can provide an avenue for individuals with autism to communicate preference for those types of things without having to immediately provide them with access to that at that moment. Cool, cool. I, uh, you know, maybe we can come back and do some more work. You know, have another conversation about that down the road because I'm sure a lot of listeners are like, oh, I want to, I want to know more about that. Uh, so, but for the time being, we're here to talk about ethics. So. Um, I want to, uh, you know, get back to your book and have, you know, just have some ethics discussion more generally here. Um, but starting with the book, I'm curious to know what the situation was that led you to decide to write a book, you and your colleagues, of course. Uh, you know, what were the marketplace signals? What was missing? You know, I think most behavior analysts use probably Bailey and Birch as their, you know, go-to text for these sorts of things. So what led you to, uh, you know, undertake this? Yeah, great question. So over the years, people have been asking me to write, to write a book. They've said, we need to have more content. And I think that everybody agrees. And I certainly agree that John's book, the Bailey and Birch book is, is fantastic and serves as a wonderful foundational text on ethics and behavior analysis. But there were there were a lot of people in particular uh, in the area of autism who were looking maybe for something that was maybe more specific or people were looking for maybe a second uh, take on the ethics and behavior analysis. Um, John's being the prevailing view, a very, a very good and, and well-respected view. I think people were just interested in hearing a different voice. And so I was. I had kind of been turning it down. You know, that sounds good. I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. Because in my area or in my um, role as a professor here, books really don't pay off uh, like the way that research articles do. They don't they don't get you um, aren't nearly as valued for tenure. So I, I was kind of downplaying the, the idea. But I ran into Jonathan Tarbox at a at a at a um, conference at Fresno, Fresno State, and he convinced me that there was a need for this and that I should hop on with the series that he was editing and, and do the book. And so I contacted David Cox and Sean Quigley and we, we talked about it extensively. You know, we said, um, if we want to do this, we want to do it right. We don't want to do, you know, uh, uh, 
kind of like a half effort job. We want to make sure that we provide the field with something that is meaningful, engaging and exciting. And I think as represented in the title of the book, something that is practical, useful and tailored to people providing services for individuals with autism. And so that was kind of the basic um, uh, starting point for uh, the book. I see. And was there a particular um, ethical conundrum that led you to kind of have this, I guess, distinct point of view that perhaps was different from, say, Bailey and Birch or a different voice, as you say? Like, was there, was there a particular question or quandary or something along those lines that, you know, said, hey, we can do something different here and add X, Y, and Z to the ethics discussion? Yeah, that's a great question. So what I have been noticing was throughout my observations, you know, as a researcher, clinician, is that people were having a really hard time taking the code and making it work for the situations that they are in. And, you know, we've got a, 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 a wide range of, um, of uh, practitioners providing services all over the country and abroad. And I think people were just having a hard time finding something that was, was working for them. And so what I've tried to do in the, in the articles leading up to the book is pick specific issues and expand or extrapolate on them to describe or provide examples about how one might be able to do that, how one might be able to customize or make, uh, you know, systems of ethical supervision and oversight applicable and relevant to their own practice. And so that's really what I think the book is, is that instead of being a broad overview of the ethics codes, which is what John's book does, and it does it very well. And he, and he talks about, you know, everything in there, and he does a great job. We've picked very specific topics, and we've expanded on them in great detail to try to tell a larger story about those topics and why they're, they are important, but also to paint a picture of how you can analyze your environment take a look at the BACB code and then create systems, antecedent strategies, if you will, to, pre to prevent unethical behavior and to create, promote ethical behavior. Well, that's a perfect segue to one of my questions, Matt. You know, I think, you know, my point of view is I see this happen from time to time, and I've heard others report the same, that, you know, practitioners think of only of the code when they perceive a violation of it. And it, yeah. by definition, I guess, is uh, reactionary. I know, you know, so they see, observe a pattern of behavior, perhaps by another analyst, and like, hmm, that sounds like it's, you know, maybe not okay, and they'll, you know, go pull up the code, or something blatant where you know it, because you know the code, you know, pretty well. And, uh, and then, you know, you go from there. Um, you know, so what are some, you know, so you, you talked about some suggestions for having it be more of an, you know, kind of a, uh, preemptive type of, uh, you know, um, point of view and things like that. What are some ways in which uh, listeners can, uh, uh, be more proactive as it relates to, uh, uh practicing in an ethical way? Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, one thing is I always remind people that ethics, ethical behavior is this discriminated operant, right? Just as we learn to conduct functional analyses, just as we learn to conduct discrete trial instruction, there seems to be a lack of attention to organizations or, you know, training programs or whatever, spending the same length of time or amount of effort on, on teaching ethical behavior. And I think ethics, I argue, is the umbrella, uh, you know, that covers everything you know, that we do. And so we have to look at it as a skill that needs to be taught. And with that, along the same line, we would never throw somebody into a situation to conduct discrete trial instruction 
and only engage in this reactionary uh, feedback measure. Okay, oh, you're not doing discrete trial well, so let me help you. Let me show you how to do it right. Any good behavior analytic instruction would involve us teaching somebody how to do it, watching them do it, providing feedback, fading out our um, our support until they're able to do it independently. And then we come in and we're, we're checking in, we're making sure that that behavior is maintaining over time. We provide feedback continuously because nothing is ever perfect. And I'm I'm trying to make the pitch that people t treat ethical behavior the same way where we analyze our environment, we take a look at, okay, what are the things that we need to do in order to be ethical behavior analysts? How do we operationalize those behaviors? How could we measure that? How could we teach that? Instead of maybe focusing on, okay, you go out and practice, but don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. I don't know of any other situation in behavior analysis where we just list what not to do and we're not actively describing what to do instead, um, but we seem to treat ethics that way. So, you know, those are my, uh, I think my big uh, points there. Think of it as a learned skill, operational, operationally define it and teach what you want to see. Um, Okay. So you don't have to wait for a, a reactionary measure to it. I got it. You know, um, I think quite a few, you know, I would dare to say the large majority of behavior analysts kind of want to do the right thing, or at least I hope uh, I, all of them, uh, you know. Um, but, you know, you, you hear the occasional horror story, but, uh, you know, I think we can assume that all of us are, you know, got into this field to use this, fantastic you know, science of ours to solve socially relevant problems. So, um, so you know, no one wants to be unethical or, or, or engage in behaviors that, you know, we, that, you know, um, at least would, uh, violate the code. Um, but having said that code violations, I think, uh, you know, do, do happen certainly. What, what are some of the, uh, what, what are some potential risks that practitioners face, uh, you know, what are some potential code violations that even the most well-intentioned analyst uh, is at risk of uh, violating? Yeah, so my big one right now that I've been paying close attention to, I think, is is with regard to scope of competence, and that being the individual uh, skills abilities that we are uniquely capable to be able to perform as behavior analysts, which is different than scope of practice. So that's the range of activities that have been granted to us by virtue of, um, you know, holding a credential or license. So you look at the BACB task list, that's our scope of practice, it describes things that behavior analysts do. Scope of competence are it involves, okay, what I am specifically trained and able to do, and, you know, mine is going to be different than yours just by virtue of our different, you know, histories. Um, I think that there is a lack of awareness of what our scope of competence is as individual behavior analysts, and I think that due to pressures through the market and all the other incentives that come along with, you know, this massive um, gold rush that we're facing right now in behavior analysis. And, and I say gold rush as just, um, you know, the need for us. Um, I'm not inferring that anyone's trying to get rich off of this, though. I know, you know, maybe sometimes people do. Um, I think that we tend to, you know, not recognize our limits and boundaries. And we end up serving kids or, or, or adults or whoever we're, you know, we are serving who we really don't have any business providing treatment to, or maybe we are the only game in town and we need to, you know, help this family or help this kid out. And we don't recognize that we need assistance. We need support. We need additional training in order to be able to maximize outcomes. And so I see this as one of the, you know, major issues in our field right now, you know, me personally, um, that I think needs to be, um, you know, just discuss more. And I'm not suggesting that all behavior analysts are doing it. And I'm not suggesting that, um, you know, it's a dumpster fire by any means. But I, th I think that we need 
or could benefit from being more aware of our own scope of competence. So we could at least make sure or access better training or more training if, if we feel like we're not really serving somebody as well as we could be. Is there a specific clinical issue or problem that, that you see that is really stressing that boundary? You know, I mean, if you think of the majority of behavior analysts being trained today or, you know, being trained to, you know, frankly serve children with autism, you know, perhaps in a, um, in the context of skill instruction, you know, is, is it dealing with severe, you know, problem behavior or, you know, or is there some, you know, where, where do you see these things show up? Um, if there's a common thing, and if, you know, if there's not, then that's fine too. I'm just curious if there's, okay, when this happens, I see people, you know, going out of their scope of, of competence, even though that might be within their, as you say, scope of practice. And I think that differentiation of those two is, is actually pretty cool. So, yeah. So, you know, you, you talk about the skill acquisition and, challenging behavior thing. And I mean, that's one of the common ones that I've seen. I know that in a lot of cases, people are being trained in, in scale acquisition. And I, and I was, that my primary focus w- was in that. And when it comes to treating problem behavior, I've seen a lot of behavior analysts run into problems. And so maybe, you know, maybe that is one example. Um, I think that another one is also you know, you've got the disability, um, you know, these inherent differences uh, with disability. So you might have somebody with autism who has another disability as well, or they might, maybe they're on medication for another disability. I know Al Poling and, and his student, Anita Lee, just recently published a study where you've got people serving individuals with autism, and a lot of those people are on medications, yet behavior analysts don't have training to be able to um, understand how those medications might work. So it's, it's yeah, like this, this you know, you know um, possibly differentiation between skill acquisition and, and behavior reduction, but it's also, I think, you know, it, I'm trained in autism, now I'm working with individuals with Down syndrome, and yet I really haven't had the explicit training to do that. Or I'm working with someone with autism and they're on medication, and I don't really know how this medication may or may not affect this person. And and so, you know, it's it's kind of, it comes up in all sorts of places, <laughs> really mad. If you want to earn a free type 2 CE while learning about what precision teaching can do for you and your clients, you're going to want to visit chartlytics.com forward slash Matt. Once there, you'll be able to see a short video that shows how an ABA agency radically improved outcomes for their learners using PT guided by Chartlytics cloud-based measurement systems. At chartlytics.com forward slash Matt, you'll also find a free newly revised and expanded ebook called Change Behavior, Change Lives Precisely. Finally, the team at Chartlytics offers intensive workshops on PT at various locations in the United States and Canada. You can find out where these are held at, at you guessed it, chartlytics.com forward slash Matt. If you do decide to attend one of these and you want to save a few bucks in the process, you'll find a coupon code there as well. So if you want to realize human potential through individual behavior change analytics, head on over to chartlytics.com forward slash Matt. What I'd like to do, though, is, is transition in some listener questions because, you know, I'm sure as you've gone through this process of writing a book on ethics, it generates tons and tons of questions, tons of interest. And so when I put out the call for questions to my listeners, uh, I, I, I got a boatload. So um, I'm, I'm not sure we'll be able to get to all of them, but we'll, we'll, let's, let's get into this. And this is one of my favorite parts of these shows is, uh, is sharing the thoughts of the listeners here. So... Um, let's get started here. Uh, so, uh, Mina asks, uh, um, I recently read an article regarding ABA being not a good method to use for children with autism. I think some people have a very skewed view of applied behavior analysis and, um, I'm kind of paraphrasing here, but she's not against other treatments and would not want, and, and wants to work as a team with other practitioners. So I guess the general question is, you know, uh, you know, in terms of, um, 
working on uh, multidisciplinary teams, and I think uh, both Sarah and Angela also wrote in similar questions. You know, can you provide some tips for behavior analysts when collaborating with other professionals, OTs, speech paths, psychologists, uh, who are skilled in their area of expertise, but that area of expertise is not behavior analytic in nature, you know, so they might be doing floor time, sensory integration, and, and whatnot. Um, you know, so both Sarah, Mina, and Angela, um, you know, had some really good questions in this domain of working on a team with people with very different points of view. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you asked about that, Matt. Now, as a, as a little bit of um, maybe information, maybe for listeners who might be new to the field uh, or those who are listening, who, who are, have been around a little longer, there is not a lot of emphasis that is uh, put forth for training behavior analysts to be collaborators. Um, Matt Tincani and one of his students a couple years ago published a study where they surveyed behavior analysts and they looked at the types of collaborative tra- you know, trainings and collaboration that they were receiving. And, and um, spoiler alert, that it's not happening. <laughs> So you've got these behavior analysts who are graduating at the master's level to be, you know, um, leaders and, and collaborators, and they go out with no training and collaboration. So unfortunately, a lot of people are learning the hard way that if you don't play nice with others, really things aren't going to work out so well, or you're going to damage the name, damage the reputa- reputation of behavior analysis. Um, and many people might have worked with people who have a sour opinion about behavior analysts because the previous one who was in there was a real jerk. And so, you know, how do we rectify that? I think, I think the, the, the most important thing or message that I have for, for people is to understand the, the, the reinforcers and the, the contingencies that are controlling the, um, the individuals that you're working with. So to talk about you know, that from a behavior analytic perspective, but to, to understand their worldview and see where they're coming from. And they are, they are informed by their own body of work, their own coursework, their own experiences. And a lot of them are coming from fields that are much more established and have been around for a lot longer than we have. And I know that Jim Carr in, in the podcast with you, he talked about a lot of these other fields are at their steady state. And we as behavior analysts are, have not yet reached that steady state. So, you know, they've got their ways in place a lot better than we do um, in a lot of cases. So, you know, by listening and understanding the perspective that our colleagues bring to the table, I think that if we work together to, you know, <coughs> create great behavior plans or treatment plans as a team, we can model that behavior analysts are good and have something of value to bring to the table. And that basically gives us the social capital to be able to add, you know, more and more and to demonstrate what it is that we do is successful. So people see it, they say, Hey man, this ABA stuff is really good. Bring some of that, you know, let's bring more to the table and let's keep doing that because it really seems to be paying off for the kid. All right. So person. what what happens then if, you know, I work in schools uh, and of course, you know, when you're on an IEP team, it's, it's all, people from all different walks of life. And I've seen circumstances where people have been like, you know, hey, can you put this uh, sensory diet in your behavior plan? You know, uh, and, I, and I guess the larger question here is, you know, uh, how, how do you collaborate while at the same time staying as true to the principles as possible yeah, in a situation and, like that? Yeah, it's a great question. So, you know, you – I think we're obligated, you know, I believe my interpretation of the BACB code is right that um, – we need to be doing behavior analytic things if we're operating underneath our behavior analytic credential. So something like that, uh, you know, the, the sensory thing might not be or likely not covered <laughs> under, underneath that, with, you know, in that, that um, scope of practice, right? But it's possible. And there are cases where, okay, maybe the sensory diet, if there's a way that that could be conceptualized as an abolishing operation 
uh, for some automatically maintained behavior and it occurs at a time where it's not provided as a reinforcer for the kid and maybe like there's some access to sensory stimulation prior to instruction and as a result the kid is a lot more engaged because he or she is not engaging in self-stimulatory behavior i think if you could translate it and make it work from a behavior analytic perspective then i think that you know i would say that that's probably not you know worth the argument of saying you know hey this isn't going to work now if we're facing something that's totally bogus like facilitated communication rapid prompting supported typing things like are going to be directly harmful for the or the person or put them at risk for harm those are are obvious situations where we need to stand up and and put our foot down and say not going to happen but Otherwise, we need to, I think, play this this delicate, um, you know, political act of okay, if this really is going to be incompatible, is it worth me compromising my relationship with these people? Um, you know, maybe jeopardizing the, our ability to work well um, for me to bring this up, because at the end of the day, we're all there for the kid and or the student that we're working with and when the adults aren't getting along <laughs> then the student certainly isn't going to in most of the situations i've had to deal with with uh, independent evaluations basically involve adults not getting along with each other and they've they've lost sight of the kid so um you know that's that balancing act we need to we really need to ask ourselves is um is it worth you know my the relationship that I have is it worth compromising it by bringing it up. But also we need to make sure that we're not doing things that aren't covered uh, under our scope of practice or that we're not, you know, trained to uniquely do um, scope of competence as well. So it's a, it's a, it's a long answer, Matt. I'm sorry. I don't know if that, you know, gets at that at all, but c complicated. I, sure. I, I think if there were short answers to ethical conundrums, uh, then, uh, we might not be getting at the relevant no. challenges we face, so no worries. Did you know Behavior Development Solutions has a bookstore? They often bring their bookstore to ABA conferences, and you may have even picked up a book or two from their booth, but all their titles are available online every single day. In a world of digital apps and online technology, physical books and curricula still play an integral role in training and in practice. And the BDS Bookstore for Behavior Analysts contains over 150 titles spanning 16 categories, from essential titles on verbal behavior and language, professional development, ethics, autism, and OBM, just to name a few. BDS has all the titles you need. Whether you are a student, a practitioner, an RBT, or even if you run an agency, you will find curricula, programs, and assessment tools and manuals, such as the AFLS, Essentials for Living, Peak, Peers, the VB Map, and more. And of course, you'll find cornerstone titles such as the Cooper Book and Behavior Analysis for Lasting Change. So check out BehavioredevelopmentSolutions.com, peruse their online bookstore, and find your new favorite title today. So Alex writes in uh, asking, I would like some discussion from Matt on how to avoid Joe's Autism Shack. Also, Matt has done some cool stuff on snake oil salesmen. I would just like to hear him talk about that as well. So I have no idea what Joe's Autism Shack is, and I Googled it and came up with all sorts of references to Joe's Crab Shack, which is I, I really don't think is what you're getting at here. So let's talk about what Joe's Autism Shack is and then move on to the second component of Alex's question. Yeah. So it's funny, Alex. Thanks for the question. And so I actually – knew Alex back from Utah State uh, through a mutual friend, and we ran a Ragnar race together. So, um, hey, Alex, what's up? Um, thanks for thanks for popping the question out. So Joe's Autism Shack is kind of like this, this term that some friends and I have had over the years to describe sort of like Cracker Jack or poorly operated ABA treatment centers. And I think that maybe people, again, who have been around for a while know, know what it is that I'm talking about. And, you know, we are facing, I think, a situation, well, I think if you're a behavior analyst and you're just graduating or you're on the market, you're in a really good place where you can have an opportunity to select the job that you want because there's so much demand. And what I have been trying to do is to describe ways for behavior analysts to evaluate the organizations that they're applying to, 
to be able to understand and maybe predict like the ethical values of that organization. Now, I know that or organizations aren't behaving organisms, and, and so it's hard for them to have values if they're not behaving organisms. But I just I say that, you know, I guess for uh, the sake of just simplicity here, because like here here's the the bottom line with this: if you are working for somebody and they ask you to to engage in unethical behavior, it is it is you not the organization that's going to be held accountable for that. And that's especially critical if your boss, let's say your boss just has an MBA and they're asking you to engage in unethical behavior. There is no recourse for your boss with the MBA through the BACB. You are the one who is responsible um, for your actions and, and susceptible for uh disciplinary action from the BACB. So the thought is, is that if we can appraise organizations, that we can, you know, put me as a professor, put my students in places where they're going to be successful and they're working for reputable businesses. Um, if we can, you know, convey to organizations that these are the values of behavior analysts that we hold dear, hoping to have this shift or pull the organizations that might not value that kind of stuff so much and say, hey, if I want to recruit, recruit high quality behavior analysts, we need to make some changes and we need to adjust. And I think that that has a large, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that it has a large, you know, kind of global effect on the quality of treatment that's provided. So, you know, that's, um, that's kind of what that's at. So we recently have a paper published in Behavior Analysis and Practice, and it's about identif identifying ethical organizations prior to an em employment. And the the shorthand name for that paper is is how to avoid working at Joe's Aut Autism Shack. So you don't want to work for Joe's Autism Shack, um, but you you do want to be careful of, about how you look at the ethical values of an organization. So you're not put in positions later where you're asked to do something that's inappropriate and potentially puts your credential at risk. I see. Cool. Um, and uh, uh, let's see, we've got a question from Twitter here at Munster BA Forum. Uh, so in Ireland, when a visitor comes to our home, we feel duty bound to offer a cup of tea. As behavior analysts, should we accept that cup of tea? Perhaps we shouldn't sweat the small stuff, or should we? So I've seen this come up in the context of a variety of cultural uh, back, you know, uh, situations where the same thing, whether it's in Ireland or uh, elsewhere, where you know it is customary to offer you know some sort of beverage, some something to eat, and it can be considered super offensive if you don't accept that. Um, you know, whereas you know, I think in and other settings and whatnot, it's perfectly fine to decline. So, um, yeah, what's your take on that? Yeah, so, you know, I'm glad you asked. So, the just as a bit of background, I think that what we're probably referring to here is that BACB code, you know, 1.06D. Why do I know that off the top of my head so code, well? Code <laughs> elements, 1.06D. Right? right? So, you know, no gifts. Thou shall not give or receive the gift. And I think the interpretation here is, you know, the T being, you know, underneath that umbrella. Um, as a bit of background, there's been lately in professions and in their ethics codes this, this um, drive to prevent multiple relationships or the development of multiple relationships. And I, the literature suggests that there's been this overcorrection where people have been very explicit or, or your ethics codes have been very explicit about um, matters regarding multiple relationships. And I believe that that has created, you know, some of the environmental variables that have possibly you know, resulted in, in um, the way that the ethics code is written now. As a result, and, and I 100% and I, and I agree that, you know, multiple relationships are bad and we should avoid them. As a result, it's created a lot of this confusion with regard to how we handle these cultural, um, the cultural values that <coughs> we're working with, and especially when they are incongruent with something that is so specifically laid out and defined in our BACB code. So, I think here, if anything, there's there's an ethic there's an ethical dilemma, right? So you've got a situation where we know we shouldn't receive gifts, but we also 
are to respect the values uh, and the culture, the cultural <laughs> values in, in other things of, of the people we serve and to act in the best interests of our client. So the argument that I'm making is that we look at and we see is, is if I accept this tea or this, this food, is that going to strengthen my relationship, build rapport with the family and increase the overall quality of care? Then I think the answer starts to, to go more so in the favor of um, doing it, of, of, of taking that tea. Now, if we're worried about the development of a multiple relationship or we think that we might look, go down that road, then, then we need to take steps to avoid that. And that's maybe where we go about in decline. And now I also understand, too, we might think that things are fine, but then later it turns out the multiple relationship has been created and we didn't you know, really have much of an idea that it was coming. So, so it's a very complex thing. So I, um, I understand the need for something that is so specific as the way that it is laid out, but I, I think that it's a lot more complex and it's not as black and white as it's been played out personally as, as an academic. You know, my advice to people is always to follow the BACB code. But I think as somebody who's looking at this stuff and researching it, I, you know, I, I don't think it's that black and white. And I think that if there's no multiple relationship that's being developed and it's culturally acceptable and you're building rapport, then, you know, the T, you know, probably OK. Yeah. And if there might be some sort of shaping to, to happen over time, so it's not an expectation that you're going to have a cup of tea every time you show up to Johnny's house. Um, and I have to also imagine at the same time, you, practitioners might have to figure out some delicate way to decline this just based off of the, the, the efficiency of, you know, what they're trying to accomplish in a, in a, there's only so many hours in a day, right? And yeah, you know, if you're taking the first 15, 20 minutes to engage in that cultural practice of having tea with the, uh, with the parent or what have you, then, you know, um, I don't know. So there might be a little bit of uh, uh, shaping that repertoire on the on the part of the uh, the host, so you can kind of get down to business sooner rather than later. But again, I think keeping an eye on the relationship is uh, more generally is is good advice, Matt. So uh, let's see. Um, we have another question about culture from uh, Louisa Gatto. Uh, I have a question: How to consider cultural diversity when speaking about ethics? with our supervisee. So Lisa, yeah, here we, we, we two, um, two white dudes are gonna, <laughs> gonna talk about diversity here so, for a second. No, I'm just... no, I mean, it, it's a, it's a good point, Matt. And, and I think that, um, again, I think something that we as a field need to, you know, reckon with or come to grips with in many ways, because we have, I think a lot of our treatment, um, materials, whatever, is a very white, maybe middle class, um, male dominated perspective. Um, and so, um, you know, th there is a lack of diversity, I think, in, in, in what we have in terms of materials and, and, and demonstrated research and so forth. So I think, you know, people who are working in these culturally diverse areas are really struggling. Um, to come up with with adaptations uh, to their treatment and their conversations. And and so I think that this is a very big need um, for behavior analysts. The first bit of advice that I have here is that, you know, cultural competency is a two way street. It involves us understanding our own biases, values um, as individuals and also our, our biases and values as behavior analysts. Cause you, you know, you look at the writings of Sigrid Glenn, she said this way back in the early nineties and probably even before that, she talks about behavior analysis being a cultural system and Skinner talks about it too. You know, Skinner talked about everything. He mentions it as well. And so we need to understand our own, our own biases and, and then we need to take a look at our, those of our clients. And also the people that we're supervising, everyone we're working with, you know, we, we take a look, understand them, and we look at their learning histories, and that allows us to be able to infer and make predictions about what they, you know, how they might behave or what reinforcers they may like. This is not to mean make gross generalizations or stereotype. That's, that's not what I'm saying. But, you, you know, you understand how you – it's all about, you know, prediction, right, prediction. And um, – 
so it's a two-way street. It's a convergence. Uh, we understand our values. We understand theirs, and we meet in the middle, and we have a conversation or a discussion um, and allow for an opportunity for those frameworks or worldviews to, to mesh together in a way that is productive. So th there has been conversation that, you know, many people have said, uh, you know, people need to conform to our behavior analytic values. We're not here to conform to the values of our clients. If they want to get served by us, they need to come um, to our perspective. And I think that that is a, um, a dated and old school way of thinking. And it doesn't, um, from my understanding, represent the uh, you know, cultural competency as, as how it's understood. So we need to meet halfway at least and, and intersect and, and work at that middle point. Got it. Uh, let's see. Uh, Elizabeth writes in, um, the white book, uh, Cooper, Heron, and Heward, uh, is one of the most widely used textbooks in ABA programs. And yet, despite knowing how deeply important and complex ethics are, there is but one scant chapter on ethics in this text. And perhaps worse still, it is tacked on to the end of the book like an afterthought. Uh, what are Professor Broadhead's thoughts on ethics and ABA texts and the inclusion of ethics throughout the entirety of ABA programs, and not only a standalone course? What messages are being sent when it is not? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, a, you know, the that text in the Cooper book, you know, I know that they've done a nice job with that, but it is, it is an overview. And I think that the lack of material in general that the field has produced sends a message that, um, or I would worry that it's not something that we need to pay close attention to, despite the fact that our CEUs are mandated um, in ethics um, areas and that it's mandated as part of um, you know, our, our undergraduate and graduate training. So what we're left with in this situation is that we have to get CEUs and we have to have coursework in ethics if there's not a whole lot of, of academic scholarly content to guide us. So what we're left with, and we've all seen this ethics presentation before, is that, you know, you go to you go to a conference and there's someone just spewing off, you know, the the code and they're telling you to follow it. And so people don't know what to do and how to expand on it. And so I think that as a field, we have got to start writing about and talking about this stuff more. I, you know, I'm trying to do it with, with David and Sean and trying to publish as much as I can. Um, I know that every once in a while there's a paper that comes out of Bobby Newman um, had done some stuff a, a while back and you know, still might continue to write about that. But there aren't a lot of groups that are having this conversation. And sometimes I feel like we're the only group that's having this conversation. And so really what I would like to see is, is other people contributing to this. And, and I don't, if it's, if it's total um, dissension of what I'm saying and there's an alternative perspective, I mean, I really would welcome that. You know, I beg for other people to contribute to this because instructors don't have anything to go on. Um, it's hard. It's hard to teach. And I would love to have this integrated throughout all of our coursework, but I think people have a hard time filling up a, a class with, with content because there just isn't a lot. I see. And it sounds like some of the gets at some of the motivation behind the work that you've done with this book. So um, let's see. Uh, Sora writes, um, I've seen BCBAs only look at data to update authorizations or even look at data perhaps weekly at best. Uh, what is your opinion from an ethical perspective of how often a behavior analyst should examine treatment data? Yeah, Sora, great question. So Sora is another person that I know uh, personally. So thanks, Sora, for um, that thoughtful question. So just to comment, I think that you know data analysis um, needs to occur at the the level in which the treatment can be moved along at in an accurate and and meaningful and and productive way. So. If it is that there's a kid that we need to look at his or her data on a daily basis, then that's the frequency in which we need to do it. If we have a learner that, you know, 
they're fairly just straightforward and, and they're coming along and, and require maybe once every three or four days we need to take a look at their data, um, then that's the level in, in which we need to do it. So I, I try to work on a matter of efficiency where I, I really like to put in the, the amount of work that is really necessary for us to get the job done. So as as agencies, when we have hard and fast rules where we only we look at data every day or we look at data um, weekly, um, it doesn't really allow us to have a tailored uh, intervention or you know treatment for that specific kid. Now I understand, or for specific kids. Now I understand when we have large organizations, you need to systematize those types of things, but um, there needs to be a level of individualization. So you know, my thought is it depends. If and the problem becomes if we are not paying attention enough to a child's progress and our lack of attention is resulting in them not receiving optimal treatment, that's when it becomes problematic. So the, I have no hard and fast rule with that uh, besides as, as frequently as you know, we can to be, help the learner be as successful as possible okay. given other resources, yeah. Cool. Uh, Celia has a question here, and it kind of gets back to what you were talking about earlier about, you know, if you're working for a company that's that's run by someone who's not a behavior analyst, and this is kind of an analogy to a school situation. So uh, here's your question. Uh, school-based BCDAs often face the challenges of operating within a set of contingencies that might compete with the uh, ethical guidelines, as well as working under school administrations that might be governed by a different set of professional and ethical standards. Can you comment and share some of your experiences with consulting uh, to many who might be in such a situation. Yeah, so I I had the fortunate uh, history of getting my PhD in a special ed program where I had extensive experience to you know considerations for special ed law and policy education you know in in general and spent a lot of time working in schools and you really kind of understand that the contingencies that control the behavior of school administrators are fundamentally different than most behavior analysts. And so I think for us, you know, we look at what they do and without an understanding of what laws, regulations, a very highly regulated system, um, especially for, I mean, if we're dealing with public ed, um, if we don't understand those constraints that they have, then I, I see why behavior analysts m might be confused, but know that once we understand, you know, what free and appropriate, appropriate public education means is that it doesn't mean that, you know, a child ought to be uh, given the Cadillac of treatment. It's, it's that everyone ought to get the Chevy, the Chevy with all respect. <laughs> um, it's once understanding those that I think it allows us to better fit in and, um, do at least a good of a job that we can given given those constraints. And this is not to say that schools um, don't do well by their students. I, I you know, more times than not, uh, schools, um, you know, are fantastic. And I'm a, a big advocate for public education and believe it's something that is very important and that we need to, um, you know, advocate for or support. But it, it, it again comes down to understanding the values and the contingencies that we're working in. And again, this might also go back to the competency you know, question you posed earlier, where if I'm trained in an EIBI private for, you know, for profit autism setting, you know, which all of that is perfectly fine. And then I'm going to consult in a public school. If I don't understand those specific contingencies, unique contingencies, rules, regulations, I'm going to be in for a world of hurt as a behavior analyst and probably not be able to do very much um, with regard to effective behavior change. So. Um, competency also involves understanding the, um, the the setting in which we're working as well. So hopefully that answers that question or at least gets at it. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Celia. Um, All righty. I got a my last question here. It's not a ethics. It's not an ethics question, but it's a cool question nonetheless. So uh, let's see. Dana writes in. Uh, what I would like him to speak about are his tips for becoming a good writer. Ask Matt to talk about his self-management project while in bats and other measures he took to get to where his writing skills are today. 
Yeah, so Dana and I went to grad school together, so it's great to see this question, and I'm glad I could answer it. And I admit that I don't remember my self-management project when I was in graduate school, but I can say, you know, with writing, you know, something that was told to me early on by a very prolific writer was that writing is like doing the dishes. You have to do them every single day, regardless of whether or not you're in the mood to do it. And the more and more you neglect the dishes, the harder and hard, harder and harder it is to, to be able to get them done. Um, and so you basically, you know, with my job depends on me writing the majority of what I do. I have to be very purposeful with sitting down in writing and and focusing on only writing, eliminating my distractions and just trying to make progress on that every single day. And I protect my writing time like it is the most valuable possession that I have as as an academic. So what I do is I schedule it in to my day. And if people want to meet, um, talk about things or whatever, th we're going to have to do it outside of those times that I've allocated for writing. So I protect it because if I don't write and publish that I don't get to keep my job. And so I have to treat that like it's it's the most important thing that I do. Um, so you do it every day. It's like doing the dishes and you protect that time and you don't let other people um, intrude upon that time. So when you're talking about writing, is it, you know, I, I understand the, you know, uh, writing a little bit every day that I think that makes a lot of sense if someone is, say, like a fiction writer, right? And they're just trying to get thoughts out on a page and things like that. When you talk about writing, are you also talking about, you know, sourcing uh, research and, you know, doing that sort of thing? I mean, it's, I think in any type of behavior analytic situation, you know, sitting down and just, you know, banging out several hundred words without referring to some sort of, uh, you know, without making the appropriate references and doing the appropriate research is, is, is kind of difficult. So I guess my, my broader question here is, you know, what are you talking about all the things that were, that would go into writing in terms of looking up, you know, studies and summarizing research and things like that, that allows you to write? Is that, does that all go into that time? Yeah, you know that's what, a great, what I'm saying. Yeah, no, I do. And so, um, if I'm like, let's say I'm venturing into a new area and I need to do a lot of front end work and understanding, um, I would I would see the information gathering uh, process, at least for me, to be to be different than that actual writing process. Okay. Um, I'll go ahead and consume that literature and then I'll then I'll try to integrate um, it into the writing because. What can happen sometimes is that you get lost in the literature and then it's it's used as a, a form of procrastination from getting words out on the page. Um, when you are writing a, about something that is familiar to you, I think, you know, I can I'm kind of at a point now where I can talk about preference or preference assessments, activity schedules, you know, ethics or whatever and write and plug in citations and placeholders from articles that I'm just so familiar with that sure. I don't need to go read them because I know what they said. Um, or, or maybe their previous articles that I had written or my friends had written and I'm, and I'm familiar with them. So that allows, I think, this fluency, right? You build up this fluency and you're, you're able to, to, to do it a lot faster. Um, but you don't build that fluency without just, you know, going through it and having your behavior shaped multiple and multiple times. So I would see that research or information gathering piece as just being separate for me personally, but maybe for others, it's, it's um, integrated. Um, but you need to be able to recognize, if, am, I, am I now just procrastinating? Um, you know, you're, you're doing a study about preference and all of a sudden you're, you're reading one of, uh, you know, Derek's awesome articles on um, behavioral economics. You know, you're, you've, you've gone too far. The, but though that stuff is absolutely amazing, um, you, um, you know, with regard to what you're trying to do, um, you've probably digressed. Right. You can go down so. the rabbit hole of uh, looking at log log graphs. Oh, and my <laughs> gosh. And, and you know what? And I max. <laughs> I love that stuff, and Derek's work is great. And I, I, um, and I, I'm saying this because I, this happened to me once. I was, I was writing, and then 
I ended up reading Derek's uh, tutorial on the matching law, and, and I'm sitting here formulating his graphs based off of, off of his task analysis, and and then all of a sudden three hours have gone by, and I have nothing to show for it but this really awesome log log, you know, um, you know, generalized matching equation graph, and I'm and I'm going okay, well I didn't do anything at work today, right, <laughs> productive, right. but I learned something, so um, you know just. Learn from my mistakes, maybe. <laughs> I, I see. Yes, yes. We're uh, we're we're fans of Derek here at the podcast. He's been on, and I've, so it makes that stuff really appealing. That uh, you know, and the uh, in different hands could could be a real snooze fest. So, anywho, um, all right, cool. Well, that uh, kind of wraps up the listener uh, question segment of the show. A an extended listener question one because obviously ethics. Uh, piques the interest of many. So uh, let's see. Um, final question here for you, Matt. Uh, what advice would you give to a newly minted BCBA? Yeah. I've, Whether it so has I'm, to do with ethics or not, you know. Yeah, I've been thinking about this. This is a great question. I have, I have a couple of um, thoughts here. So one bit of advice that I was provided uh, by Brian Iwata. He came out to Utah State in summer of 2010 and gave a, um, a talk to the graduate students there. And he had said to us, look at somebody in the field who has been successful and model your behavior after them, because clearly they've done something right. And that has been something that's really resonated with me. And he was talking specifically about research. So one of the things I've done is I've, I've I follow very closely the work of uh, Jim Carr, Linda LeBlanc. I think that they're both brilliant um, researchers, academics, um, clinicians, and and they've really kind of been my focus of what I'm trying to model, you know, a lot of my work and and um, you know impact off of. But I think it also translates too to um, you know clinicians to look at people who you find to be successful and prolific and learn from them as, as best as you can because um, they're doing something right and, and they are good models for you. Um, another bit of advice that I have is to stay humble and honest. I think that people, and this happened to me myself, If so, you know, as a bit of an autobiographical tale, I graduated with my master's degree and I really felt like I was something special and could really conquer the world and tackle any problem. And I learned very quickly that I was so wrong and that I really had a lot to learn. And now as an academic, I understand that I really don't know anything. And that as a field, we have a lot of uh, growing to do and a lot of things that we still need to understand. So if behavior analysts just recognize that, you know, they're in it for the long haul of lifelong learning, and that just because you graduate and get your BCBA does not make you, you know, proficient in all things behavior analysis and that there's still a lot to learn and a lot of ways to grow. I think that we will be a lot better off. So that, yeah, that's kind of my advice um, if you're just getting started. So stay honest and humble. All right. Good stuff. And so uh, lastly here, uh, where can people reach out to you if they have more questions about this? And again, remind us uh, the name of the book and uh, where that might be available when it is published. Yeah, so I'm at Michigan State University. Um, so if anyone wants to come out and join our master's or doc program, please you know, contact me. My website where I have my contact information and information about the book is mattbroadhead.com. So M-A-T-T. B R O D H E A D dot com. Um, and there I have my email address, how to contact me, and I also have information about the book, either to pre order it, and I, I also hope to have some uh, additional and supplementary content for the book once it comes out. So, book being titled Tentatively Practical Ethics for Effective Treatment of Autism Spectrum Disorder. And again, we're looking at June for that. That's what I'm hoping. Yeah, we have. The book is in the hands of the series editor right now. It's finished, and we're just waiting on a couple like very small changes, and then it's going off to the publisher. So I don't anticipate that it's going to be much longer. Awesome. All right. Matt Broadhead, thanks for joining me today on the podcast. And, uh, yeah, thanks for taking time out of your morning. It's been a fun conversation about ethics and uh, 
playing drums and all sorts of other cool stuff. So yeah, thanks for having me, Matt. I appreciate it. All right. Take care. Thank you for listening to the Behavioral Observations Podcast with Matt Sicoria. You can find Matt's notes on this episode at www.behavioralobservations.com. We also invite you to stay connected with us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash behavioral observations and on Twitter at Behavior Podcast.